Okay, guys, it's virtual California rice harvest here in 2017. I know I'm in the shadow of the cab, but I just want to use this time for you guys to uh, get your bearings and using 360 degrees if you haven't done so already. So what you can do is swipe with your finger up, down, left, right, all around, to check out all the views around us. Or also you could just kind of tilt the camera or put your camera inside a VR headset like Google Cardboard or something like that. Uh, just so you know, the black spot is the base of the camera or the roof of the cab. And when I edit uh, certain clips or merge them together, uh, it will always start back on me. So that's what's happening if you're, for example, looking out at me cutting rice and then all of a sudden the camera shifts and it's back on me. It's because I've merged two clips together although I'm trying to make this just one fluid shot. Um, however, I will be editing uh, a little bit. Okay. Um, also, I'll be pointing out directions to you, like look left because I'm doing this, or look right because I'm doing that, drawing attention for some specific areas. Um, so you can either follow me along with that or just check out whatever you want to check out. Uh, otherwise, uh, let's talk more about harvest. In the last episode, I asked you guys a lot of questions. I'm going to answer some of those. Uh, so we're going to do a whole lot of stuff. It's just going to be me and you here in this cab harvesting rice. Uh, no music. We're just going to listen to the sound of the machine, uh, the sound of cutting rice. Um, I do, though, have my normal title card. So if you'll look at me, if you're not already, I am Matthew Sliger. This is Rice Farming TV, episode 49. And, of course, we are... In California, it's October 2017. As you noticed, we're at the equipment yard. Let's start this bad boy up right now. You hear the engine purr, right? It's still a little quiet right now just because the separator's not on, the machine's not active. I'm going to lift my header up a little bit. That's just telling me my grain tank is open. I know that. It should be. I'm going to kick it into high throttle now. Right foot is shifting into third gear. Finger is pressing the third gear button. And checking my mirror. Seems clear. Up in front of me here as I'm making this turn, you can see we've already harvested that field. Uh, we've also mowed and chopped the straw into smaller pieces uh, and also disked the straw into the dirt to help incorporate it and now we're just waiting for winter water so that we can flood it and start the decomposition process of that straw. Uh, the field now is to my left being blocked by this tree. We're saying goodbye to the equipment yard, heading down to the field that we need to cut. Always a little precarious on this gravel road just ahead of me because to my right I've got this drainage ditch. Don't want to fall down there, although the road is nice. I'm not sure how far ahead you can see, but we have the Sutter Buttes just ahead of us. We're heading right towards them. Hopefully you can see me a little bit better now that uh, we're kind of more in the sun. Okay guys, I'm just going to continue to head down to the rice field. Okay guys, so we've dropped into the field. This is where I left off yesterday. If you look around, you can see we just have a little chunk. Um, right now, I'm going to engage my separator over here with my right hand. I don't know if you heard that difference. Okay, now I'm going to throttle up and I'm going to check my settings. These combines are made for different crops and therefore uh, there are different adjustments depending on what crop you're harvesting. Right now I'm checking my screens in the back making sure they're open enough to allow the grain to fall through. Looking at our upper screens, now I'm looking at my concave, that's um, how close it is to the cylinder. Uh, 23 millimeters apart from teeth that are spinning around and now my cylinder speed is 650 RPM so the cylinder is spinning 650 
uh, rotations per minute. Uh, the concave is 23 millimeters away from that. Uh, the cylinder, of course, has teeth, and that's what's helping uh, separating straw from grain. I'm going to throttle down now. Up front, the combine, you'll see I'm going to start the header. Throttling back up. Moving into position. And let's cut some rice, finally. All this maintenance in the morning, allowing that morning dew to dry. Getting my adjustments set now. As you can see, the rice is laying down still. It's laying away from me and to the left a bit of me. Getting my reel in position and I'm combing it towards me. The sickle blades there are cutting it below. I've got the reel spinning uh, at two and a half miles per hour. The reel has those combs on it, that's what's feeding the header down below. The sickle blades are what's cutting the straw. The conveyor belts are, as we call them, drapers, are moving the cut straw to the center of the header. And as it's passing through that beater drum, which is, has those pegs, that silver drum there, just in front of my feet, which has pegs, which are feeding the straw down and allowing it to be fed into the feeder house. The feeder house takes the straw from the header and into the con line. The concaves and the cylinder are spinning right behind that uh, feeder house, and that's what I was describing earlier when I was making those adjustments. Right now, my ground speed is one and a half miles per hour. I'm just kind of easing into it. I uh, don't want to go too fast. I'm looking out my side here, and it looks as if I'm probably cutting about five inches off the ground, which isn't too bad. Even though this rice right now is down, it's still kind of fluffy, uh, so I'm able to get under it, but I still need to use this reel up ahead of me to comb the rice into the combine. If you look out to the left, you'll see that I already have quite a bit of harvested field, and if you look to my right, uh, you can see I've just got this strip of uh, uncut rice uh, that we're going to do together right now. Um, right here, my right hand, if you look at my right hand, I have this joystick that allows me to uh, raise the header up and down, the entire header there. It also has uh, buttons that allow me to raise the reel out further back towards me and also up and down so everything is completely customizable depending on which way the rice is laying um, and depending on the cutting conditions. Okay. Got my top speed up to 1.8 miles per hour. Also another very important thing that I'm looking at is my engine load. The engine load tells me uh, how hard the combine is working, processing uh, grain, separating it from straw. If my engine load reaches 100%, I'm working too hard and I'm in trouble and at risk of clogging the entire machine because I'm cutting too fast and bringing in too much plant matter and it's having a difficult time separating it. So I can clog this entire machine full of straw if I try to cut too fast. My optimal speed is going to be somewhere around 2.6 miles per hour. As you can see, this direction it's much easier cutting because the rice is laying into the header. So I'm able just to kind of scoop it up and I'm going 1.2 miles per hour with an engine load of 31%. So I've got a lot of room for air. Uh, as I get more comfortable cutting today, I'm definitely going to uh, stress that, increase my engine load, and therefore increase my speed. Uh, so you can see, we can't just drive through a rice field at 10 miles per hour because we want to get done. We need to go at a pace at which the combine can separate strong grain, saving the grain, spinning the straw out the back. Making my turn here. Cutting towards the south, again, as you can see, past that tree line just in front of me, we've got the Sutter Buttes. To my left, we've got a drainage ditch, also a nice tree line. Uh, seems like we're going pretty good. Some, some combines have yield monitors in them, which tells you how much you're yielding. Uh, this combine does not. Uh, just uh, cutting away. Pretty 
easy cutting. I don't like to listen to music too much because I like to be able to hear the machine. The machine will tell me how hard it's working. I'm not sure if you can hear those variations in volume of the machine, but if it starts grinding down, lugging down, then that's telling me that I'm probably taking in a little bit too much uh, straw. I could then uh, raise my header up a bit and therefore cut less straw and therefore process less straw, or perhaps I just have to slow down. Of course, slowing down is the last thing I want to do when I get a good rhythm and I'm cutting rice nice and smooth. I'm going two miles per hour and my engine load is bumping up in between 75% and 45%. Uh, but two miles per hour right now is a pretty good speed uh, for the condition of the rice and it's still kind of early. Uh, so we may still have some outside moisture, I hope not, uh, that could create just kind of more of a matted straw. So right now I want to get to some of your questions that you guys asked on the last episode uh, that was titled, How to Harvest Lazy Rice. First question I have is from Colorado Sean, and Colorado Sean asks a great question. He wants to know how often we need to sharpen the sickle blade, the sickle blades that are down at the header there uh, cutting the rice. And uh, Sean, that's a great question. We have three combines. Right now I'm cutting by myself because this field is so small, but we have three combines cutting and we cut 1,600 acres. So between the three, we try to only go through one set of sickle blades per harvest, per year. Meaning that we don't sharpen the sickle blades, but we pop them off and replace them with new sickle blades every year. Um, now, if I were to damage the sickle blades, like run into a levee or the road or, or dig the header down into the dirt and I broke some sickle blades, unfortunately we'd have to take the sickle bar out, which is attached to all the different individual sickles, um, and we'd have to replace that out. So, trying to avoid any breakdowns, therefore keeping my header up and not needing to replace any sickle blades until uh, the end of the year uh, in preparation of next year's uh, harvest. Great question. Uh, Palesta, she asks if uh, there's any black brown night herons out here in the rice fields. And there are, I see them often. Uh, beautiful little birds. If I could edit this better, I'd show you guys a picture if you're not familiar with them. I don't see them too much uh, in the rice when the rice plant is growing. Um, more kind of in the winter time or on the roads or around ditches or around the banks of the rice fields. I mean, occasionally you will see them in the rice fields, but we do see them. And she also asked, do waterfowl manure provide enough nitrogen or fertilizer over the winter time? As, as many of you know, a lot of migratory birds come and create a, a habitat inside these rice fields because it's just the perfect habitat for them. Uh, so we get millions of ducks, geese, migratory birds, shorebirds, uh, herrings, all kinds of birds uh, that are making their homes in California rice fields throughout northern Sacramento Valley. Um, but uh, I just don't know if there's any studies on how much their uh, droppings are contributing uh, to nitrogen. I do know one thing, organic rice farmers that only use chicken manure to fertilize their rice fields, they use around, okay, depending on the variety and the soil, they can use about two to six tons of manure per acre. And I just have to think that birds sitting in a rice field over winter are not producing two to six tons of manure and therefore allowing us to uh, cut back on any nitrogen application we do during spring. Uh, but I will be asking the folks at UC Davis if they have any studies that have determined approximately how much nitrogen uh, migratory birds are contributing uh, to the rice fields. Okay, if you can see out to my left here, that's Doug. He's driving a bank out. He's come up to me early because I already have my unloading auger extended. The reason I have my unloading auger extended already is because uh, I wanted to get it into a really good position because if it's out too far, you guys won't be able to see it in the 360 degree camera. And he's up next to me and I have not enough rice to unload to make it worthwhile, but I'll do it anyway since he's here. 
So check out to your left, or I'm sorry, it's my left. Check out there. We've got Doug pulled up next to me, and I'm going to unload some freshly harvested rice right about now. There you can see my unloading auger extends out. The last thing we want to do is stop cutting rice. So Doug pulls up next to me as we drive, going about 1.8 miles per hour. I could be going faster, but this rice again on this pass is laying away from me. Doug's doing a good job keeping up with me, keeping the grain cart bin kind of under the unloading auger, collecting all that rice. We don't want him, of course, spilling any either. After he collects all that rice, he's going to head up north to a landing uh, where trucks and trailers are parked, and he's going to drop off that rice. It'll take him several trips back and forth unloading me until he can fill up a set of doubles. Uh, but once he does, uh, the truck will then take off to Red Top Rice Dryer and deliver the rice to be dried down to storage moisture um, and kept until sold. The unloading auger on and off and on and sweep is all located on the same joystick of which I'm controlling uh, my header and the reel and also I can't control my speed with the same joystick where my right arm is. Okay, I'm completely unloaded. You can probably see a mound of uh, rice there in the back of the bank out. Off he goes with the partial load. Not the most efficient use, but a good demonstration for you guys out there. So my thumb is constantly, my thumb, yeah, just my thumb is constantly working, moving my header up and down, my reel in and out, depending on which pass I'm cutting, because the rice, of course, is laying in different directions. Harvey, I, our Harvey's got a great question. Uh, he saw Pops at the end of last episode, helping me enter a field, and he asked, was that your Pops? at the end of the video, and you normally need a spotter uh, when we start into a field. No, uh, we don't normally need a spotter, uh, and yes, that was my pops, and he was there for that reason because that particular field uh, was still pretty muddy, so he went out and scouted it. He wanted to see how far out away from the levee the field was muddy uh, because he wanted me to avoid that pass, and so he just kind of stayed out there and signaled for me uh, how far away from the levee I should stick out. Um, also, at the beginning of the day, he does like to be outside the combine and making sure I don't have any leaks, uh, that everything's running properly, and that I want to be able to see on the monitor here or just from uh, listening to it in the cab. So he usually likes to just check out the combine for five minutes first thing in the morning, make sure from the outside everything looks as if it's running smooth. Okay, making my next pass here. It's going to be a short pass. It could have just whipped around, um, but I like showing you guys. I think I'll do that at the next pass. Um, Joe Lumberg. Joe Lumberg, I just want to give you a shout out, man, because you've been so supportive and commenting on YouTube and Facebook. And I know you commented on last episode that you were looking forward to this video. Uh, I hope you're enjoying it. I hope it's turning out well. Um, it's hard for me to cut and monitor. Um, what's being filmed while doing everything together. Um, Mark wants to know, how much does the high moisture of the rice lower the sale price? Well, Mark, the high moisture doesn't affect it uh, directly. That only affects our expenses at the dryer. If we're taking in rice that isn't completely ripe, uh, then that's just an extra expense for us, right? Optimal harvest moisture, as I mentioned in the last few videos, is 19-20%. Uh, storage moisture is 14%, so it costs us money to get it down to 14%. We will cut at 23-24% even, uh, just to make some headway as we're getting pushed up against fall rains. Uh, we want to get as much rice in before it rains, so that, might, that means we might be cutting um, at higher moistures. That's just what we got to do. So when we're cutting at 22, uh, that's just that much more of an expense to get it down to 14. Now, if we cut uh, really, really green rice, um, maybe that could cause some discoloration. Uh, maybe it's green because uh, it can't 
dry out and ripen and that means there's moisture in the canopy and that can cause fungus to discolor the rice and then we could get a lower grade low, low, lower quality mark for our rice uh, and then we couldn't sell it as number one grade rice which is what all consumer rice is that you buy in the supermarket number two grade rice would be for pets or some other uh, type of sale not for human consumption and of course that would be a dramatically lower price i've never luckily needed to sell rice at a number two grade so i'm not exactly sure what that price difference would be but i imagine it might even be somewhere uh, half half as much as you could get for selling uh, number one grade. so so i asked a question last week he wanted to know if it would be possible to make a video on how to drive the harvester and how to drive the bank note. So, I don't know, man. Let me know if you think this video is covering it. I mean, I'm kind of going over everything it takes to drive this combine. Um, the speed I'm going right now is two miles an hour. I'm cutting, got my header low, got my reel going fast. This rice pass is nice and easy because it's falling right into the header. It's leaning towards me. Um, so, so far it's smooth cutting. You saw how I unloaded into a harvester. I think this pretty much covers it. I mean, the bank out, I would need to get inside it to show you guys in depth on how to do that. It's hard for me to make these videos during this time of the year, guys, because I need to be efficiently cutting rice. I can't just hop out of the combine and get a super sweet angle. So I thought this 360 degree camera uh, would help with that. And I don't want to make this video too long. I could have you guys just driving around with me all day. I'll be out here cutting until sundown. So as you can see, uh, towards my left knee there, I've got my lunchbox. I packed leftover pizza there. Um, let me just swing around. Sometimes these short passes uh, aren't worth it to make, so I'll just swing around and make long passes. As you can see, out to my left, I've got a whole nother check of rice to cut that is part of this field on the other side of that levee. Now I'm getting into position, dropping my header down, make it one fluid movement of making the turn and coming in to cut this rice. Well, there you have it guys, California Rice Harvest 2017 in virtual 360 degrees. Let me know what you guys thought about this video. If you guys would like to see more 360 degree videos, if I was talking too much, um, but I hope you guys weren't looking at me the whole time. So thanks for watching guys. Please subscribe really share this video. I really encourage you guys to share this video because I haven't seen too many 360 degree videos out there about harvesting rice or any other crop for that matter. So let's see if people are interested in these types of videos. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. If you like this video, I appreciate a thumbs up. 